Uh, so, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is David Pearson. I'm the chairman of the Panizzi Council uh, Selection Committee, and I am delighted in that capacity to welcome you to this, the 38th annual series of Panizzi Lectures. The good ship Panizzi has had a few bumpy rides, I think, in recent years. We had COVID, and then last year we had an electrical fault that moved us into the British Library's entrance hall, and... This year, the British Library is still somewhat in recovery mode, I think, from its well-known uh, system problems. But the show does very much go on, and I am delighted that you're all here, both in the room and online. We can once again welcome the whole world to the Panizzi Lectures through the wonders of modern technology and contemporary live streaming. And we are hugely grateful to Jonathan Hill and to Christopher Sokol, distinguished booksellers in New York and London respectively, for sponsoring the costs of that live streaming. So wherever you are tuning in from, as well as those of you who are sitting in the room, a very warm and sincere welcome. The Panizzi Lectures were founded about 40 years ago by Catherine DeVass, a longtime lover of both books and of the British Library, and they were named after one of the Library's great heroes, Sir Antonio Panizzi, who served the British Museum for nearly 40 years. He was its principal librarian from 1856 to 1866. He was a moving force in creating the great cultural institution, which we now know as the British Library. He created the British Library's catalogue. He built its famous round reading room in the British Museum, turned it into the Brit biggest library in the world. The lectures build on his achievements by using the library's resources to advance knowledge and understanding in any field relating to, associated with the history of the book, they're a central and an integral part of the library's events program, and we hope they will always remain such. We're always keen to draw in as, as wide an audience as possible, to be excited and to be inspired by discovering new ways uh, of learning about the history of books. And since 1985, that brief has been addressed by a distinguished <coughs> roster of scholars, and it's the challenge and the privilege of the Panizzi Selection Committee to sustain that, that line of distinguished lecturers. It's always a pleasure to welcome old friends to uh, the Panizzi stage, and so I am delighted to be able to introduce this year Professor Henry Woodhausen, the rector of Lincoln College, Oxford. I think I must have first met Henry about 30 years ago when he was a lecturer in English literature at University College London, and we were both interested in book sale catalogues. He rose within UCL to become a professor, head of department, dean of the faculty, before moving to Oxford in 2012 to be a head of house. His administrative and political duties in that capacity have not dimmed his research enthusiasm or output, and he has long built on core interests around 16th and 17th century English literature. His books include Sir Philip Sidney and the Circulation of Manuscripts and editions of Renaissance Poetry. He co-edited the 2010 Oxford Companion to the Book, and he's just published a groundbreaking piece on the 17th century second-hand book trade in the latest Oxford Companion on that theme. His topic for the lectures is the very fascinating figure of Thomas Hearn, diarist, non-juror, antiquary, librarian, a familiar name to anyone who has worked on Oxford book culture around the turn of the 18th century, but who has not, I think, been seriously studied for some time. I think Henry is going to put that right, and I have every expectation of an entertaining as well as an erudite Panizzi series. So I should give the stage to Henry, it is very much his, not mine, to give his first lecture on Hearn's Matters. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, David, and thank you very much um, to the uh, selection panel of the Panizzi uh, Foundation for inviting me to give these lectures. Um, and thank you all very much for being here, either physically or virtually. Um, I can see you physically, but I can't see you virtually, so um, I'm sure there are many friends um, and interested people watching. Um, three lectures. Um, that may not bear quite as much 
connection to, the, to their titles as you think, um, uh, uh, as you might expect. Um, today is Hearn as a librarian and a diarist. Not that he was a diarist. Um, next Thursday, not this Thursday, but the Thursday week when there's a train strike from Oxford, just right easy, um, I shall be talking about Hearn as a collector. And then um, I think a Thursday after that, um, I shall be talking about Hearn as a publisher. And um, so that gives you a sort of basic understanding. But here is our hero um, with um, a bit of um, the duds here just to uh, cheer us up and amuse us um, while I gabble away. So it's a great honor to be asked to give this year's Panizzi lectures and to contribute to such a distinguished series. I well remember coming to the first of them, the great Don Mackenzie's Bibliography and the Sociology of Texts in 1985, a set of lectures that stimulated a profound change to the way that bibliographers think about and look at books. I seem to remember that Don was still at work on them in the Old North Library just before he delivered them with Ian Willison at his side. Full of new ideas and suggestions, urging him on with brilliant thoughts. To follow in the wake of Don Mackenzie's wonderful and fertile mind is, to say the least, rather daunting. So I shall, from the start, admit that I have no new ideas about bibliography and its various aspects. Paleography, codicology, typography, bookbinding, book illustration, music, cartography, historical, critical, I'm beginning to sound like Polonius, critical, descriptive, and analytical bibliography. I, uh, uh, with which these lectures are usually concerned, although I shall touch on some of them, not really music though, in what I have to say. The argument of these lectures, in as much as they have one, is that an interest in such subjects, in what we might call the material book as a repository of meaning, was evident in the life of work and work of the early 18th century librarian, scholar, book collector, and publisher, Thomas Hearn. A full account of the history of English book collecting in the later 17th and early 18th centuries still awaits a better pen and a deeper knowledge of the subject than mine. Such an account might pay particular attention to Samuel Pepys, whom Hearn never met, to John Bagford, 20 years Pepys's junior, whom Hearn knew well and liked, and to Humphrey Wanley, 20 years Bagford's junior, whom Hearn also knew well and came to cordially hate. Th Thomas Hearn, a few years younger than Wanley, would certainly play a part in the story as the fourth of the group who saw books as historical objects. Hearn had and still has the rather undeserved reputation of being one of the grumpiest crossest and most malicious figures ever to have walked the streets of that home of grumpiness, crossness and malice, Oxford, a place where success can still be measured by causing the maximum amount of offence with the minimum amount of effort. He is not an immediately attractive figure, someone who could not keep himself out of rows and was convinced that he was always right, but then he usually was. Alexander Pope, will rem admirers of Alexander Pope, will remember that he is much mocked in the Dunciad, referred to by name in a note on its opening page and appearing by association in person, of sober face with learned dust besprent as Wormius in book three of the poem, the representative of scholarly dullness, past, present, and future, a mere pedant. A sketch written later of him by Edward Gibbon condemned him as poor in understanding and described his minute and obscure diligence, his voracious and undistinguishing appetite, and the coarse vulgarity of his taste and style. Pope and his friends were not alone in finding Hearn a suitable subject for satire during and after his lifetime. In this engraving and etching from about 1720, Hearn is the figure in the foreground about to enter Ruley House. There he is. 
that's Hearn, viewed from the back, about to enter, uh, about to enter Antiquity Hall, a little house so-called from... Argent, three diotas, two handled drinking vessels proper, allude to the halls being an ale house with a zithopsy or brew house where mild ale was served. In the cartouche above the inscriptions, he is the central one of the three men standing outside the Sheldonian Theatre and the Ashmolean Museum. To his right, is the great paleographer, Humphrey Wanley, and to his left, John Whiteside, the keeper of the Ashmolean Museum. The plate was commissioned by two Oxford MAs, Francis Wise of Trinity and Thomas Tristram of Pembroke, described by Hearn as very conceited fellows and of little understanding. He said it had the plate had very silly, ridiculous things and words in it and was one of the weakest things ever done. Although unsigned, it's confidently attributed to George Virtue. And Antiquity Hall can stand as representative of some of Hearn's distinctive interests. Antiquities such as the Roman pavement found at Stonesfield, uh, down there, found at Stonesfield, that Hearn was extremely interested in and engraved, the printing and publishing of books, the Sheldonian Theatre, the classicising of native remains, and ale. If Hearn was well known in his own day, he's a rather less familiar figure nowadays, despite a very good book on him published in 2002 by Theodore Harmson, who also wrote the compact account of him in the ODNB. The challenge with Hearn is not that too little is known about him, but that too much available material exists. He left behind about 190 manuscript volumes, of which around 130 consist of a chronological series of notes about his life from the 4th of July 1705 until the 1st of June 1735, days before his death. Add to these more than 30 volumes of letters addressed to him, about 350 manuscripts from the Middle Ages to his own times, and at least 5,000 printed books that he owned, as well as his 37 or so main publications in nearly 80 volumes. And the richness of available material about Hearn turns from a feast to a surfeit. In more ways than one, Hearn's was a life of, in, by, and with books. Hearn's notebooks were first published by Philip Bliss, the principal of St. Mary Hall and a well-known book collector, in two volumes in a limited edition. Nope, we've lost those. Oh, there they are. Yes, there they are. Two volumes in a limited edition. Bliss had begun work on them 40 years earlier. It took him 40 years to get them into print. The two volumes were dedicated, not entirely suitably, given Hearn's relations with the Bodleian, to the splendidly named and featured Bulkley Bandinel, Bodley's librarian. Bulkley by name, Bandinel by appearance. Bliss died in the November following their publications, having left his own marks on the volumes of collections. Twelve years later, a second enlarged edition was published by John Russell Smith in three volumes as part of his library of old authors. This supplied more material from his notebooks, to which was added the account of his library, edited by the equally extravagantly named Beriah Botfield, from a manuscript then at Norton Hall, Northamptonshire, and originally published in 1848 in a limited edition of 75 copies. Yet, the world still cried out for more of Hearn. And between 1885 and 1918, the Oxford Historical Society met the need in 11 substantial volumes of about 4,000 pages, reproducing the text of almost all of the notebooks, collections, and a substantial part of the correspondence, either in the author's own words or in summary. A rough calculation suggests that Hearn's collections are twice the length of Proust's great novel. Something about a summarising Hearn competition inevitably comes to mind. 
the OHS project's editors were in different colleges and worked on the project at different times. The last one was the great medieval historian H.E. Salter, who did the last four volumes and who got more and more cross with Hearn's historical uh, mistakes as he wrote the commentary for it or produced footnotes for it. There is more to be said about this OHS project, including its censoring of Hearn's fruitier stories and language, the omission of much material, especially about books, and the inadequacy of its indexes. But it has satisfied most people's Hearnian cravings. Hearn's volumes are still rewarding when read entire, Harmson says in the ODNB article. Few, I suspect, have risen to the challenge. The volumes reveal a man dedicated to scholarship, especially to books and coins, buildings and inscriptions. The histories of manuscript production and of printing animated his life. He studied the forms of books as well as their contents, arranging and cataloguing them first in the library at St. Edmund Hall, where while still an undergraduate, he added all the hall's holdings to the 1697 Bodleian catalogue, and then from 1701 at the Bodleian itself. He filled his rooms with books and had a successful career as a publisher. These will be the subjects of my three lectures. They could only begin to scratch the surface of Hearn's interest in the handwritten and the printed, there is plenty of room for a really large book, perhaps a project about Hearn and books. I can only provide a preliminary sketch touching very briefly on his religious and political beliefs, the university and the country in the first 30 years of the 18th century, and his own public and private lives, which I think are very fascinating. It is an Oxford story, but is by no means confined to the city. Drawing on the notebooks and the letters, those OHS volumes tell something of that story. You will notice that these are all Hearn's collections apart from volume eight, where they become Hearn's remarks and collections. Spoils the look of the shelf. Initially, Hearn inscribed each volume as his diary. This was then deleted in and in the first two volumes, he decided to call them collections and observations. But then they become just collections before he finally settled on remarks and collections, which you can just about make out here. So diary at the top, remarks and collections at the foot. Around 1714, he stopped calling them anything. In his entries, he occasionally referred to them just as remarks, collections, observations, memorials, memorandums, memoirs, and notebooks. They were part of his book collections, in other words, that included other manuscripts, but his preferred formula was to refer to himself as the writer of these matters, harem rerum scriptor, as he once described himself. The English phrase was varied so that he was the writer of these memorials, these accounts, even these things, a favorite word of his. The avoidance of the first person singular is not so much a modesty trope as a reminder that he was recording what he knew of a matter at the time. Salter, the OHS editor, pointed out that he was not writing a diary, rather, it was not a record of his daily doings, but as it were, a collection of materials for a history of his times. At a very few points in the volumes, he envisaged that his notebooks would find readers. Hearn tells the reader very little of his daily life beyond books and work, though he reveals he liked to read while he walked on his excursions in and around Oxford, that by no November 1716, he seldom went to coffee houses, that by the end of his life, he would not go to a tavern as opposed to an ale house. He usually ate in the buttery of his college, St. Edmund Hall. That's on the ground floor here. Hearn's attention was focused almost exclusively at anything else on his work. Although late in life, he took an increasing interest and in pleasure like John Bunyan, in bell ringing. 
His father was a parish clerk in Berkshire, but Hearn was brought up among non-jurors who refused to take the oath of allegiance in 1689 to William and Mary and their successors. Hearn almost never reveals whether or where he attended worship, instead praying in his room. He regularly called his fellow non-jurors who went to church compliers, referring to a smooth-booted complier, smooth boots and sly boots being favourite terms of abuse. He once recorded on Easter Day 1716 that he received the sacrament in Edmund Hall Chapel, staying at home on purpose upon that account. That's just once in 4,000 pages. His practice in compiling these matters changed and developed over the years. His commitment to writing a more or less daily set of entries led him in the early 1720s simply to start copying news from the public prints. After a while, the habit changed. By late October 1730, he could claim, I do not read many newspapers. And he took to copying the contents of letters that he had sent and received into the daily entries often forgetting to change the pronouns that in the, in the new context are out of place. In the summer of 1710, a visitor to the Bodleian Library would have seen Hearn in a gown moving around the shelves of old and new books, looking at them with an unusual degree of interest and taking the occasional note. In one book press, he noticed that in a binding of collections of authors, de Morbo Gallico, two fragments of a Latin manuscript chronicle, written in a fair and neat but ancient hand, had been used as paste stands. On the next shelf, he found two more leaves of it pasted upon a Latin Hippocrates. That was on Monday the 3rd of July, 1710. Just over three weeks later, on Thursday the 27th of July, he came across the Dowie 1630 English translation of Cardinal David du Perron's reply to King Charles I. And unfortunately, I, I can't, I have been able to get access to this book, so there's just a horrid image of it from uh, Ebo. Under the author's picture are the translatress's verses to him, written in a most neat and elegant hand. And in the next leaf, the lady, that's Elizabeth Carey, Viscountess Falkland, has written verses most neatly to the Queen Henrietta Maria. In August, our man notes a collection of pamphlets given with a great number of other books by Mr. Robert Burton of Christ, Master Robert Burton of Christchurch, known to modern readers as the author of The Anatomy of Melancholy. A few days later, he notes two books with the neat hand of John Aubrey in them. A month later, Pierre Pitou's collections of epigrams and poems attracts his attention because it had formerly belonged to Dr. John Dunn, whose handwriting appears at the beginning. Just before Christmas 1710, in another part of the library's collections, he came across a book in the Muscovitic language, and he provides a reference to the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, which must be consulted, for cataloguing some Indian manuscripts in the Bodleian Library. In May and June 1711, he came across a copy of Appian's Inscriptions, owned by Edward Gwynne, certainly a most curious collector of books, he says. In June, he finds a polyglot psalter printed at Cologne in 1580 that belonged once to the learned Master William Bedwell, who wrote his name and the date 1586 in it. Quite hard to see, but I hope you can just make it out. Thomas Hearn, the man in the gown, was library assistant or janitor to Bodley's librarian, John Hudson. Hearn had been Hudson's appointment and joined the library in 1701. Settled into the post, Hearn was working his way around the library looking at books as part of the library's major cataloguing project. In the seven years between July 1705 and July 1712, even with a six-month gap in the second half of 1711 when his attention was elsewhere, Hearn recorded in his collections the shelf marks of about 600 bodily and printed books and manuscripts, providing notes on most of them and often reading them. Of course, Hearn was interested in the contents of the books he pulled off the shelves, in who had written what, when, and what they had said. But he was also 
rather unusually interested in the material features of books, in books as objects that do not just convey or carry knowledge, but are themselves of historical or personal importance. Looking at manuscripts paste down, manuscript paste-downs in bindings, he anticipated the work of Neil Carr and our own David Pearson by two and a half centuries. We may wince at the word translatoress, but Hearn's interest in women's writing and handwriting as distinct areas of studies is evident not just in his note on Viscountess Falkland's book, but in his, his enthusiasm for the manuscripts of the ingenious Esther Inglis, whose fine writing he greatly admired. The provenance of books was particularly absorbing. Burton's, Dunn's, and Gwynne's books are still the subject of attention by book historians. But Hearn was perhaps the first scholar to note a book belonging to the former Dean of St. Paul's. Nor was his interest only confined to Western books. Beside the Muscovitic and Indian books already mentioned, by 1710 he had already looked at Selden's map of China when Edmund Halley came to the library. The ingenious professor of geometry at Oxford, Halley, concluded that the map was full of faults. Hearn noted the presence of divers Chinese books, done up several of them together in blue covers after a new manner. The leaves are double, and the dog letter, by which I think he means the letter R, is upon the fore edge. I haven't gone down and checked whether there are R's on the four edges of Chinese books from this period in the, in the Bodleian, but perhaps Richard will be able to tell us later. One of Hearn's principal tasks was to prepare a new edition of the Bodleian catalogue of printed books. The last one, Hearn believed, had been the work of Emmanuel Pritchard, but published under the librarian Thomas Hyde's name in 1674. By 1701, the catalogue was badly out of date, and the library itself had little sense of what books it had acquired during the last quarter of a century and what books it lacked. Hearn's task was to bring the catalogue up to date, and that involved looking at the books on the shelves. The task was not a small one. By 1714, in a very characteristic calculation, Hearn counted 36,085 volumes on the shelves in the library. That's printed books. As he worked round the shelves, he compared every book with its entry in Hyde, adding notes on anonymous publications and books by authors of similar names. He copied all his editions and corrections into an interleaved copy of Hyde, that's still in the Bodleian, of course, and produced another two volumes of ma manuscript editions as an appendix to it. Eventually, Hudson changed his plan and decided that the new catalogue should contain the updated Hyde and the additional books in one publication and took it out of Hearn's hand. Although in February 1716, the delegates of the press ordered a thousand copies of the catalogue to be printed, work on it did not begin until 1727, and even with two compositors setting it, progress was slow. The fourth catalogue of the Bodleian's printed books was eventually published in 1738. Hearn's contribution to the work was not mentioned. A decade later, in 1748, the price of the catalogue had had to be lowered from three guineas and two pounds five shillings for large and ordinary paper copies to two guineas and 30 shillings. By 1785, so uh, 40, nearly 40 years after it was first published, over 460 copies remained on small paper of an edition of 500 copies. And all but 20 of these were pulped. Hearn also worked on updating and improving the entries for manuscripts for the 1697 catalogue, the Catalogi Manuscriptorum Angliae, often attributed to Edward Bernard, but 
um, as we now know, not really entirely by him. In fact, not at all entirely by him. In addition, he took an interest in the Bodleian's coins. Revising Ashmill's manuscript three-volume folio catalogue, producing a separate supplement to it, and in 1704, writing a manuscript catalogue of the Smyrna consul William Ray's collections, as well as those of some others, Thomas Smith, Rafe Bathurst, that had come to the library. When Francis Wise published a catalogue of the Bodleian's coin collection in 1750, again, he did not bother to mention Hearn's work. Long dead, Hearn would have expected no less from his old enemy who hath usurped my place of second librarian. Wise was one of the originators of the antiquity hall plate. Hearn rarely described the shape, the shape of his working day or what he was expected to do, what he called my daily business and my constant attendance at our public library. He kept notes on visitors, both English and continental, to the Bodleian. He recorded meetings of the curators and their annual visitation of the library on the 8th of November when they were entertained by a speech in praise of Sir Thomas Bodley. Those who used and published material from the library's collection, Hearn felt, should give copies of their publications to it. He believed that such persons as have been of the university should take the tr trouble to have what they have printed sent to the public library. He kept a list of those who failed to do so that ran to 62 names, including fellows of colleges, Bishops and clergy, a head of house, and Joseph Addison. Tut, tut. Sir Thomas's statutes for the library, Hearn felt, should be followed, and he noted with some asperity when salaries for the library officers were paid late. A slightly more detailed set of Hearn's duties can be attained from a note written in 1711, describing his duties in the second half of September and all of October. 1711. Most of these duties, such as putting up books in their places, that is, returning them to the shelves and bringing them down, fetching them for readers, entering and chaining books, lasted between half an hour and two hours. On the 15th of October, 1711, he spent an hour telling over and modelling the books, that is, counting and arranging them. Later in the month, over two hours and four hours were taken up with visiting, that is welcoming visitors, perhaps admitting them as readers or showing them the library and its treasures. The system of admitting graduates to the library, undergraduates were not allowed to use it, was in flux and may have been part of his work for which he would have received a small income. The placing of books was a serious matter. When Thomas Tanner gave a manuscript to the library with a piece by John Bale, uh, the Protestant reformer in it, Hearn noted that I placed it myself. And he also recorded that John Wallace, the polymath, was so vain as to look at where his picture and his books were put in the library and seemed well pleased with their placing. These notes from the autumn of 1711 may be related to his promotion the next year, on the 22nd of July 1712, to second librarian. That move entailed a change of duties. As under-librarian, he fetched books and put them back, but he only began to deliver them to readers when he was promoted. And even then, manuscripts and books from certain locations should only have been given to readers by the librarian. The new post also gave Hearn access to the Bodleian's collections of coins. He started taking notes towards his catalogue of them. And he was greatly concerned when he discovered that the individual collections of coins had been promiscuously mixed together. The library was for Hearn, as it has been for many readers, an ideal working place where he had an almost unlimited access to books, 
and to coins. At the same time, it was where he served a sentence of what he called drudgery, where his duties, I have been a drudge for so many years to fetch all such books as are lodged above share stairs, prevented him from pursuing his scholarly interests. Even if these included the drudgery of collation, of cataloguing books and other such work of that kind. When he saw a way out of this drudgery by becoming the senior university Esquire Bedell of civil law, he wished that he could have some such post by which I might follow my studies with greater ease and be able to be a benefactor to that place, the Bodleian, to which I owe so much. Part of his unhappiness in the post, first as library assistant, and then a second librarian, was caused by his relationship with his patron, John Hudson, the librarian. I'm particularly pleased by this slide of Hudson's handwriting, which seems to me to be very thuggish. <laughs> the two men were initially friends, and then they quarreled. This was a pattern in Hearn's life so that by the end of his time at the library, he could describe Hudson as a man of a damned proud, conceited temper. By November 1715, things were coming to a head, and at that year's visitation in November, Hearn was told by the university's vice-chancellor that Hudson had lodged a complaint against him, and that the VC believed the majority of the curators would be against me. His enemies moved swiftly, and on Monday, the 23rd of January, 1716, Hearn, having already resigned as Esquire Bedell and his place as archetypographus, supervisor of the university press, declined from that date to act as hypobibliothecarius or sub-librarian. He retained his keys to the library. These allowed him to come and go as he liked, but on the day he actually left, the 23rd of January, the lock to the lower door to the building was changed. And he was not only debarred the place, but deprived of whatever belonged to me there. A successor, John Fletcher, the chaplain at the Queen's College, was put in by Dr. Hudson, though the place was not, that I know of, declared vacant by the visitors a move that will be familiar to modern ears when someone is appointed to a post without its being advertised. I'm sure such things never happen in libraries or academic institutions. Hearn could never forgive those who, in his view, had forced him out of his position, returning to the wound again and again. During the remaining 20 years of his life, he avoided the place he once loved, as he put it. I have not been there many years, he wrote in April 1727. This was not entirely true. For five years earlier, he recorded being told by a friend there was a strange confusion made in the Bodleian by a whimsical project of putting all books of the same bulk, by which I suppose they mean size or format, together. He was asked if he would just peep into the library and see what they were doing. He just stepped up and found what he said to be very true, although he said he was much concerned to find such disorder. Despite that, it's hard not to detect just a moment's schadenfreude in the confusion visited on the library by his enemies. Some of his friends were irritated by his self-imposed exile. Though you have the same liberty of the Bodleian as other people have, John Bridges of Lincoln's Inn wrote to him in 1723, yet you choose to debar yourself from that place. In Hearn's view, this was wrong, for he had been debarred from the library. And to ask intruders for things would be to acknowledge their authority. To ask intruders for things, that word things again, by which he means, I think, books. He was now, as he put it, confined to his own books. But there was a second consequence of his exile. His finances were reduced. Again, characteristically, he kept a careful record of what he felt should have been paid from his last salary on Michaelmas Day 1715 to the time of my acting again. 
For every Michaelmas Day and Lady Day during the next 20 years, he recorded five pounds more salary due to me. For every Michaelmas Lent Easter and Act term during the next 20 years, he recorded, I have had no fees for admitting bachelors of arts. This first phase of his, his adult life ended in great unhappiness, but had been preceded by his esteem and success. We may not know the date of Hearn's birth, birthdays were not Hearn's sort of thing, but he was baptised in July 1678, the second son of the parish clerk of White Waltham in Berkshire. His mother, Edith, died when Thomas was at Oxford in his early 20s, and his father, George, remarried. Thomas attended the free school at Bray near Windsor, but was also privately educated by Francis Cherry in his house, where his great friend, Henry Dodwell, also lived. Hearn matriculated from St Edmund Hall in December 1695, went up as an undergraduate in 1696, took his bachelor's degree in 1699 and his master's in 1703, joining the Bodleian in 1701. The hall was to be his home for the rest of his life. He wasn't a fellow of the hall. The hall had no fellows because it was a hall. It only had a master and a vice master. Um, who, who did the, whatever teaching there was, but it took undergraduates. And how, Hall, how the Hall accommodated Hearn for the rest of his life is unclear to, to, to everyone. He just seems to have stayed there until he got the rooms he wanted and sat there until he died. In addition to the Latin and Greek teaching he received at school and at university, Hearn was deeply influenced by the religious and political views of his tutors, Cherry was a Jacobite and Dodwell a non-juror. If Hearn was never an open supporter of the Jacobites who wanted to restore the Stuart monarchy, he was certainly a non-juror. This was a fundamental point of faith for Hearn and lay behind many of his positions and attitudes and the rows he found himself drawn into. Even in, the early, even in early 18th century Oxford, non-jurors lived in fear of persecution, especially loss of office, and worse, for their beliefs. They were also keen book collectors, interested in a wide range of subjects, including the history of the Church of England and such continuities as could be found between their faith and the past. The training Hearn received before and during his time at Oxford made him an excellent scholar. In addition to this, he added impressive editorial skills, learning how to chart transcribe manuscripts, to collate texts in manuscript and print quickly and accurately, and to make indexes. Mastering these disciplines proved useful when he began his own publishing career. This will be the subject of the third lecture. His work in the Bodleian added cataloguing books and manuscripts to what he could offer friends and patrons by way of scholarly services. Naturally, it was Hearn who was invited to catalogue Dodwell's and Cherry's manuscripts. The great collector Thomas Rawlinson started asking him to catalogue his study, especially my manuscripts and rarer printed books, as early in their friendship as March 1713. By the end of that year, he had received an offer to be librarian of the Royal Society and keeper of its museum. In January 1715, he recorded learning some time ago of Dr. Radcliffe's design of constituting me his librarian. Once the library Radcliffe gave to the university was built in Oxford. The salary was thought to be £150 a year. The Herald, John Anstis, came up with a plan for Hearn to claim money from William Pettit's will, again, £150 was mentioned, by publishing some of his collections from his huge gift of manuscripts to the Inner Temple. There was talk of Hearn's becoming Harley's librarian. In all these proposals, except Radcliffe's, the idea was to get Hearn to London. Anstis was explicit about the design I have to get you in this town. Yet Hearn rejected all these offers, in fact never visited the capital, never worked in the Cottonian, 
or royal libraries, or saw the libraries of the College of Arms, the Inns of Court, Lambeth Palace, Sion or Gresham Colleges, the Royal Society, or the huge private libraries of such great collectors as Harley or Sloan. This Frost Fair souvenir with Gothenburg, there's Gothenburg and W. Caxon, was probably commissioned by his friends in the capital. It was on the 19th of January 1715 that Hearn was appointed the university's archetypographer. Why was Hearn so reluctant to go to London? or anywhere else that was much beyond walking distance of Oxford, even to see his father in his old age and then his dying days. Declining Rawlinson's offer of employment, he reasoned that he had made a resolution long since to do what public good I could in the world. He sought a place where I could carry on my public designs with more convenience finding Oxford to be most suitable for prosecuting those designs, and would not leave it till I am fully convinced that another place will be more proper for those designs. This was written in July 1713. He found excuses not to go to London, and just as many excuses after he was debarred from the Bodleian. This refusal to go to London may have resulted from a genuine anxiety about being in the unfamiliar and rather scary metropolis. Another element was spelt out in a letter written in May 1710 to his patron Cherry. My confinement to the library and the several new curiosities I continually light upon, together with the trouble of Republican times, make me keep close to Oxford. Hearn was nervous of being away from Oxford, and that while he was away, upon my absence, his rooms in college might be searched, my chamber might be seized upon, or at least rifled. For this reason, he usually kept the doors to his rooms locked. Letters, those valuable signs of friendship, were to be guarded, concealed, never shown or communicated to others without the writer's permission. In other words, Hearn, his fellow non-jurors and sympathetic friends, lived something in a state of constant anxiety or even paranoia that their affairs would be revealed. Write not a word of politics, he told his father. And when George Hearn died, Thomas asked his stepmother to burn any of his letters, they being now fit only for the flames. And when his patron Cherry died in 1713, Hearn destroyed all the papers he writ to me that were of a private manner. Through her friend Mrs. Dodwell, he asked Cherry's widow, Elizabeth, either to have his letters, letters to her husband burnt or transmitted by some safe hand to me. Hearn's chief concern was with his manuscript defense of oath taking, sorry, manuscript defense of taking the oath of allegiance that he had written in the form of a letter to Cherry in June 1700. Nearly 30 years later, it came back to bite him. <coughs> On the death of his widow in 1731, Francis Cherry's papers went to the Bodleian. Hearn's manuscript defence now came to light. In it, he argued that it was permissible to take the oath, a position quite different from the one he adopted during the rest of his life. He stated that he had only lent Cherry the manuscript with a desire that it might be returned or else destroyed. Consequently, the right of this thing the manuscript, belonged and still does belong to no one but myself. He alone could dispose of it. Yet 20 or so years after the copyright of 1709, Hearn's invocation of a form of ownership of literary property had no effect. The essay was published in November 1731 by one of Hearn's old enemies, John Bilston or Bilson, chaplain of all souls and janitor of the Bodleian. It was Bilson who Hearn noted got the new keys made to the Bodleian. Hearn kept up a front of indifference to the publication of the letter in a pamphlet, claiming never to have seen it, calling it a very silly thing. Bilson, the most impudent fellow, that vile wretch, did not act alone. It clearly rankled with Hearn that one of his abettors was his old persecutor, yet again, Francis Wise. 
The pamphlet attack lived on after Hearn's death, its preface forming the basis for Edmund Curl's impartial memorials of Hearn's life of 1736. The collections were an essential part of Hearn's scholarly work and also of his private inner life, even if he is reticent about it. Besides his formidable, formidable memory, his system of indexing each notebook made it possible for him to return to matters of interest relatively quickly and efficiently. The signs of this can be found in later dated reference he inserted relating to earlier matters, usually as footnotes or in the margins of entries and in cross-references that he added to other volumes. It doesn't seem as though Hearn reread and annotated the volumes methodically to reflect on and update times past. The notebooks were a scholarly and personal resource for use rather than for re retrospective reflection. They were something else as well, for in the body of the volumes, he included all sorts of material, manuscript, printed, and more exotic, that he collected and thought worth preserving. Sometimes he included letters he had received, or ones of historical interest, such as two autograph letters written from Oxford by Charles I that have been missing from volume 53 of the collections for many years. The volumes contain much quasi-facsimile copying of material, such as this rather lovely signature of Queen Elizabeth I. But there were also more strange reproductions of runic inscriptions and uncial letters and some Irish pleasingly misidentified by Hearn's editors. Hearn also included occasional parts of medieval manuscripts in the volumes, their parchment so long tucked up that they are often hard to unfold. These Middle English lyrics came to Hearn from Richard Rawlinson, at, at, and at the, time that, at the time that Hearn's interest in and enthusiasm for helping his Christchurch friend John Urry in his Chaucerian editorial labours was at its height, hence the rather optimistic attributions. It's clear that these fragments came not from recently dismembered manuscripts, but from the paste downs of later books. The same is probably true for this leaf from a southern French breviary of the late 13th or early 14th century, showing two noted hymns. The printed fragments that he pasted into his collections include part of a leaf from a very rare German block book, here seen on its own, just make out the fragment, I think, and here, next to a full page in glorious technicolor of the original. A relic of a different kind is a rather tattered copy of an indulgence to those contributing to the rebuilding of the Hospital of St. James at Santiago de Compostela, printed in Antwerp in 1497. Heard had fragments from Incunabula printed on parchment as well as paper. As might be expected, he particularly liked examples of early English printing, such as this piece from Thomas Lineker's 1521 translation of Galen's De Temperamentis, printed at Cambridge by Johann Sibbach. Hearn thought that Erasmus' letter writing manual, also of 1521, was the first book produced at Cambridge. And this unidentified poem, although someone may be able to identify it, is only known from a single leaf that he preserved in 1712. Anything to do with Oxford was carefully preserved, including this title page and a 1714 notice of a reward of 100 pounds offered by the vice chancellor for information about a man in a cinnamon colored coat who delivered a treasonable letter to the mayor of the city. Hearn especially enjoyed ephemeral items such as old or new ballads and slip songs. This popular ballad about the beautiful shepherdess of Arcadia is known from several printings, but Hearn's appears to be unique. 
Other songs might be printed or engraved. The collections were an ideal place in which to place and preserve such items as book plates of the unknown and the famous, or in Hearn's eyes, infamous, Gilbert Burnett, or tickets to trials. Found objects were also included. These might range from this rather obscure printed inscription for Henry Hall, given to Hearn by his compositor, John Rance, to this magnificent woodcut taken from a woodblock discovered in a house in Brewer's Lane, Oxford. The block had been used in Thomas Bentley's The Monument of Matrons, 1582, and shows, among much else, Queen Catherine Parr receiving the crown of life and an olive branch from the resurrected Christ. In Hearn's second state version, that's the one on the left, the cartouche for the Queen's name is empty, but without the printed inscription. How this fine block got from Henry Denham's printing office in London to St. Aldate's is not known. Less considerable items in the collections volumes reflect the daily commercial life of the times and the work it gave to printers and engravers, though whether the card maker was a relation of the Oxford scholar is unknown. To the classical and native inscriptions that Hearn himself recorded, the coins and medals he drew, the buildings and structures he sketched, not always very elegantly. He added other, more exotic material. He loved impressions of seals. That could be taken in several ways, couldn't it? Impressions of seals. Aristocratic, historic, and rather unexpectedly erotic. Other familiar odds and ends, including pins, such as a piece of overpriced cloth on the left, or an historic lock of amazingly well-preserved medieval hair, can be found in the volumes. More unusually, he preserved two panels from a Tudor stamped bookbinding, providing physical evidence of Hearn's interest in this aspect of book production. The same can be said of what I think is a unique specimen, but I may be wrong, of what he calls asbestos paper that he pasted into one volume of the collections. It shows evident signs of an unsuccessful attempt to burn it. Probably puts, needs to be put in a nuclear bunker somewhere, <laughs> away from uh, prying eyes and hands of readers. The volumes that became the scores of volumes known as Hearn's Collections were themselves used as a store for his own collections, not quite a paper museum on the scale or the glory of Cassiano dal Pozzo's, but still a significant and underexplored repository of Hearn's things, his matters, as he called them. Don Mackenzie ended his Panici, Panizzi lectures by calling for a new concept of the text in history. I'm not quite sure that Thomas Hearn provides us with such a concept, but his interest in books as history has been, I hope, worth pausing over. In just a week's time, on Thursday the 7th of December, over a week's time, we shall join Hearn in his rooms at St Edmund Hall to have a look through his book collection. Thank you very much. Henry, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I think we will all be looking forward to the next one, uh, and I trust we will be there. Um, I think you know we're getting a sense of someone of great industry, um, an intriguing character with building these wonderful collections, but another whole side of his life that I guess we're going to hear more about. Um, 
uh, a, 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 um, eccentricity across grain. Uh, I, I, no, I, mean, I, no. I look forward to hearing more. Meanwhile, I think, I think, <laughs> couldn't comment on that. Uh, meanwhile, I think we have time for just a couple of questions. Um, if anybody uh, has anything that they would wish uh, to put to Henry, who has kindly agreed to uh, to take them. Tony. There's a microphone coming. Um, what you were showing, particularly in the last week of your talk, uh, about the, the fragmentary nature of the materials Yes, yes. I mean that 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 can that can be done and has been done very well um, by uh, Magatch, uh, who has looked at the collecting of fragments, particularly by um, uh, Bagford, Bagford and Ames, um, and so on. Um, and I think Hearn is part of that. But I will have more to say about fragments on Thursday week, um, and they are quite extraordinary, um, the volumes of fragments that he had, Hearn had, and was given. He got, people came to know uh, that he was interested in them and sent him fragments, and allow, uh, 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 which he kept and had bound together. And they're rather fascinating, the collections of volume, manuscript volumes of, of them in the Bodleian. Um, but, but they're only part of, part of the story. Uh, I think people have looked at those volumes quite carefully looking for particular things, but I don't think anyone's quite, quite got, to, got to the heart of what was going on and what the market in fragments at that time was. Um, and some of the fragments, I mean, the ones I showed, um, I was saying, I think were paste downs, um, very largely. But the bound volumes of fragments tend to be of more than one leaf sometimes of choirs of manuscripts that had, had, had been dismembered. Um, and presumably, a lot of them came from binders, from book binders, um, who, who, who decided they didn't want them anymore um, and passed them on to, to Bagford, Bagford and Wanley. Um, and Wanley was, of course, particularly interested in them from the history of paleography. Good. That was the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> no. Right? It's Michael. Oh. Could you say something more about how... Thank you. Um, could you say something more, Henry, about how his politics um, inflected his, his kind of behavior the way he moved through Oxford, the way he collected the materials, um, the way he warred with so many um, individuals, both in correspondence and in person? I, I, I mean, that's a very interesting and a very large subject. Um, and um, I, I think the answer is that uh, he, he warred with people because uh, he had um, a very high moral standard that he tried to keep to. Um, and it is very hard to find him telling lies or telling evasion, making evasions in the diaries. And he felt that there were an awful lot of people in Oxford, especially in the colleges, who shouldn't have been there, who weren't doing any work, and worse, were fellows of colleges who were married. Um, and he very strongly disapproved of that. Um, and, and it's interesting, I mean, it's extraordinary in the diaries. First of all, the number of fellows who kill themselves um, that he always notes down. He's very interested in suicides. Um, and also the number of fellows he identifies as having wives or um, concubines or whatever you want to call them, partners, um, yet who don't give, up, don't give up their fellowships. So I think he was, he was quite difficult 
um, with people there. And um, uh, he was very good at being rude. I've got pages and pages of his insults, which I plan to use um, uh, in, the, in the few months before I retire. Um, and um, I think that, 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 that really what, what animated him about all of this was his sense of being in opposition in Oxford, not being a fellow of a college, um, and uh, being cast to one side by both his religion and his politics, which were looked down upon and uh, disapproved of. And, and some of the, I mean, if, if you look at the life of George Hicks and Hicks's letters, Hicks lived in absolute terror that he was about to be arrested and put, you know, sent to jail. And I think Hearn sailed close to the, close to the wind about some of this. And that made him a very difficult, difficult figure. Now, how, that, curiously enough, that seems to have almost no connection with Hearn's collecting. Um, and various people go on sending him material. Of course, the Rawlinsons, uh, Richard Rawlinson, was a non, I think they were both non-Jervers. Um, and um, you would think that Pope... Alexander Pope um, and Hearn would have something in common, which were, was that they were both outsiders. Um, Pope, who, who was banned, barred from the city of London in the same sort of way that, that Hearn barred himself from going, from going to London and living, Pope living at Twickenham, uh, Hearn living at Oxford. But, but most of Hearn's friends were, although there were a sizable number of non-Jervers, they weren't all non-Jervers. Uh, those who gave him material, and I, in my next lecture, I'm going to talk a lot about people who gave him bits and pieces and books um, because they knew that he needed material to work on. Um, and there is, no, there is no difficulty that he has personally with either Sloane or Harley. The difficulty with Harley is that Humphrey Wanley stands in the way and he really cannot stand Wanley. Um, <laughs> probably because they're, 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 they're two peas from the same pot. Um, and that, 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 that Hearn is, is uh, um, Teddy Hall, very involved in Univ, books and manuscripts, and, and Wadley is exactly the same, uh, even to the same colleges. Sorry, that's rather a rambling answer, as usual, to, to, to your question. But it is a very, it, 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 it's interesting to think that actually confessional faith does not bar you from having friends who are Whigs. Um, and who don't believe in the sort of Tory, high Tory principles that he does. It's a, I mean, perhaps I'm reading it too much through various modern filters, but um, it, is an, it, it, is, it is quite striking um, that, that, that Hearn can get on with people whose political views he does, and religious views he doesn't, he doesn't share, if he wants to, if he feels there's something scholarly going to come out of it, or um, publishing, or books going to come out of it, then he's quite happy with it. We clearly have a lot more good stuff to come, and I hope we'll, you'll share some of the, uh, the more colourful, you know, these colourful quotations um, of Hearn's that you're kind of tempting us with. Um, I think at that point, uh, we should call it a day for now, uh, but I hope you will all be here again a week on Thursday. Do tell your friends, uh, and meanwhile, it only, uh, we only need to thank once again uh, very sincerely, uh, Henry, for uh, an excellent first lecture. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.